So all, the, all, all those conversations really had uh, an impact uh, on me and helped me better understand the IoT. Probably if I asked you what's the IoT for you, we would all come up with uh, different, uh, different definitions. Um, as you would expect, there is no one generally accepted definition of what's uh, the IoT, but probably all of you uh, have a smart device. Um, so if I ask you to raise your hand if you have one smart device, two, three, four, okay, so three seems to be the majority. Uh, when I asked the same question, uh, when I started this project, nobody was, nobody even knew exactly knew uh, what I meant by a smart device, uh, apart from the smartphone. That was the only thing that people could, uh, could think of. Um, as a working definition uh, in, uh, in my book, that I use, uh, I use the following um, that uh, thing. So uh, rather than talking about smart devices, I usually talk about things. Uh, I don't like the idea of smart. Uh, there is no nothing smart uh, about, uh, about these devices. That's a very anthropomorphic uh, attitude that we shouldn't follow. Um, a thing is an inextricable mixture of hardware, software, service, digital content, and data. So that's the first bit of the definition uh, that we can unpack maybe uh, in, a, in a second. And, and a thing has interconnectivity, sensing, and actuating capabilities, and interfaces to the physical world. Uh, I know it's a lot in just one definition, but I wanted to cover what I think are the key features also from a legal perspective. So things that we need as lawyers to keep in mind to understand the legal issues that we have uh, in, the, in the Internet of Things. Uh, the first thing to, to keep in mind is the physical element. It's a double physical element. Physical element as in uh, a material, physical, tangible object and physical element as in an object that has an effect on the real world, on the physical world. And that's, uh, that's really important. Uh, I'm going to explain more when I refer to the idea of this rematerialization, uh, why that's important. Interconnectivity, it means obviously that it's connected to the internet, but also interconnected with uh, other devices and, uh, and systems. The idea of sensors, uh, can you think of any example of a sensor in your phone or in other smart devices that you have? Sorry? Mm -hmm. For example, or GPS, or you know, all these, uh, all these devices that uh, collect information about the physical world and transform it into data flows. That's a sensor, uh, and that's I think pretty much uh, obvious to most people. What's less obvious is this idea of the actuators. There's the other element of uh, of a thing, of a smart device. Uh, not only the IoT is about sensing, so you know, collecting information, transforming it into uh, data flows, but it's also about using that information to act on the physical world. Obviously, a kind of very stupid or simple example would be uh, if you ask your um, virtual assistant to turn on or off the light. You are having an effect on the physical world. But you can think about examples in healthcare, in warfare, that are obviously much, uh, much more uh, important. <coughs> and yeah, and then this idea that uh, a product traditionally, uh, if we think about a good a product, we think about the tangible and hardware dimension of it. Uh, whereas, uh, also as Professor Borg Borgi was mentioning, uh, now one of the points that I kind of keep coming back to is the idea that uh, it's really quite difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish between the hardware, software, service, data, and digital element components of a thing. So when you, have, when you see a simple product like this, you have to think about all these different elements that, in a way, merge, uh, merge in it. And all of these elements that I mentioned have legal repercussions. Um, this, slide, this slide has the purpose of showing you how artistic I am because I was able to do <laughs> this uh, diagram. Uh, but it's also about start thinking about uh, all the, where your data comes from and goes to. Uh, that your, your phone and your smart devices are constantly sending data back to the manufacturer and to other devices 
or to other users, etc. And you have quite complex relations which can be contractual, non-contractual, quasi-contractual, uh, etc. Um, why is it why is it important to deal with the IoT? As usual, you know, uh, because it's economically relevant. That's one of the reasons why we study things uh, because they are uh, important in that sense. We have uh, well, it's been I think five years that we have more smart devices than we have people in the world, uh, and that's you know already something. And now currently, we have 14 billion uh, smart devices. And we're going to have 31 by 2025. Um, the IoT innovation is faster than other technological innovation. If we look at the patents, for example, they grow 40% faster than other technological uh, patents. Uh, profits from the IoT are currently 5.2 uh, billion USD. And the, the focus of my book um, is really on smart home. And this is justified by the fact that this is the most profitable market segment at the moment of the uh, of the IoT with 132 million users, and um, I use a case study approach, uh, in particular study in the terms and conditions. Billions, yes. Um, in particular, study in terms and conditions of Amazon Echo, Alexa, etc. Uh, and the reason for that is that the leader of the market is, as you would expect, or I don't know if you would expect it, it's Amazon. Um, and again, also looking at uh, the global growth in patent applications, um, consumer goods are the, the sector that is growing uh, the most. And this justifies the, you know, the scope, the, the approach that I took to this, uh, to this study. So why do we need to study the IoT? That's, I suppose, the key. one answer is because it's economically uh, important. Uh, social important because we all have smart uh, smart devices, uh, but also from a legal perspective, it, it's also very important. Um, a lot of uh, lawyers uh, in Italy for uh, over a century uh, have been dealing with the issue of what happens uh, with when uh, legal regimes that were designed for uh, for tangible uh, for the tangible world. Can, uh, are applied to the intangible world. So the classic example, uh, as uh, Professor Caterina um, has studied, is the example of can we have possession of intangible goods? Can you uh, exercise uh, factual powers over software that is intangible? Um, and that was actually also my PhD thesis was uh, very much focused on, uh, on, on, this, on this idea uh, that new technologies um, constitutes a real challenge to pre-digital worlds precisely because of this because pre-digital worlds were designed for ta the tangible tangible goods uh, and, and that tangible reality um, and I'm not saying that this is no longer important so the idea of dematerialization tokenization <laughs> digitalization are really really important today um, if we think about have you studied the NFTs for example or have you Came across yes NFTs that's the main example they, they are the big thing at the moment and, and they're all about this idea of tokenization uh, so when, when you are de de digitizing and dematerializing uh, tangible tangible goods so I'm not saying that that's no longer important what I'm saying is that there is something else that is currently understudied uh, there is this idea of the return of things, the return of material uh, things. We, it's not just about the IoT, uh, it's also about other things like uh, robotics, uh, 3D printing, uh, etc. Uh, what do I mean by ritorno delle cose, return of things? Um, what I mean is that, that traditionally if we think about data, if we think about service, if we think about software, um, we think about them in their intangible existence. There's something that you cannot touch. Traditionally, that's how we conceive of data and service and, and uh, software. With the IoT, all these intangible things become tangible again, become material again, because they are embedded in uh, physical products. So, a thing, a smart device, is a, a sort of non-binary category. It's not, you know, traditionally we would have uh, intangible goods, 
tangible goods. Now we have a, a new uh, category or a spectrum uh, where it's very hard to say if something is really tangible or really, uh, or really intangible. And this is a problem for the law. Why? Because the law is binary. The law loves very clear-cut categories. Uh, it's a good, it's a service, uh, it's offline, it's online, it's uh, digital, it's not digital. Whereas the IoT challenges all these binaries and overcomes, to some extent, uh, many, uh, many of them. And that's what I mean by rematerialization, and that's why I think we need to study these uh, things more. Um, and that's, I suppose, one of the contributions that I tried to give um, with, with my book. How do I do that? Um, I, I did that through uh, kind of a socio-legal uh, methods. I mentioned the uh, text analysis of terms and conditions of 254 text, uh, terms and conditions of uh, Amazon uh, Echo, uh, but also through uh, interviews, through analysis of um, discourse analysis, looking at uh, consumer forums online, what consumers are concerned about. So yes, obviously looking at the law uh, in a traditional sense uh, and, and the case law, but also trying to see how the law plays out in contexts, uh, not only uh, on the books, but also, uh, also in action. Um, and at the same time, what I really wanted to uh, sort of what I was influenced by was kind of Marxist uh, legal, uh, legal theory. Um, in the sense that, in at least, well, two uh, sense. The main tenet of a Marxist theory of law is that uh, the law is not an essential component of uh, social uh, order. It's, the law is a subtle, and I quote, a subtle and pervasive ideology which serves to obscure the structures of class domination within the state. Um, and I think as lawyers and legal researchers, uh, uh, it's, it's a, quite a challenging statement um, because we usually rely on the idea that through the law and through law reform we can address the challenges uh, of society, including of, uh, of technologies. Um, and, and so to think about the fact that the law is actually a way to obscure a class oppression, class domination, power imbalance, I, I think it's something that uh, challenges us. But I don't think it's something that is entirely unfounded. Uh, and if we think about very practically, for example, uh, the role of the tech in lobbying, uh, in lobbying European lawmakers, uh, for example, for ages now we've been trying to pass uh, the new e-privacy regulation. Well, I, I don't know, it's, I think it's eight, ten years or something at this point. Um, and it's, it's, it's become apparent that one of the reasons why we couldn't really pass this law was Amazon lobbying uh, the EU so that we wouldn't get there. Um, so this is a very practical example that shows you why the law is a, a tool for oppression. One of the reasons is precisely this, that certain groups, certain private stakeholders have a very important influence, uh, either direct or indirect, on the shaping of, um, of the law. Um, so, again, the law can be sometimes obviously important, the law, I'm not discounting the importance of law reform, but my sort of point of view is that we cannot limit ourselves to this idea of the law of regulation as a solution to all um, to all problems. Um, as Marx wrote in the Capital, the law helps capitalists to prevent workers uh, from gaining awareness of their own interests and from organizing to act in common. Mm -hmm. So, what I what I try to argue here is that. Um, the solution to the problem is that we, as the new workers of the IoT, we gain consciousness of our status and we organize uh, to collectively fight for, to change, to change this uh, phenomenon of the IoT and the internet more, uh, more generally. And the law doesn't help us do that. The law actually tends to make us fall asleep in terms of consciousness as um, would, um, would have it. I'm not going to go too much into kind of Marxist theory, obviously, uh, but that's kind of a, just to tell you what, where I'm coming from. Um, 
And again, this is not a, it's not a Marxist book in, in the traditional sense of uh, the term, but it kind of influenced my uh, way of seeing things. Um, this is just to show you the structure of the book. Uh, this is the table of contents of, um, of the book. I start by uh, kind of looking at uh, regulation. How does the EU regulate or not regulate the IoT through a mix of self-regulation, co-regulation, traditional regulation? Um, but the problem is that many, most of these attempts are again relies, rely on binaries. Uh, again, between good service, offline, online, etc. Whereas the IoT challenges these uh, binaries and dichotomies. Um, I then analyzed uh, the 254 terms and conditions of uh, Amazon Echo and Alexa to, to get some empirical insight of what the problems are uh, in, in the IoT for us, the end users. Um, I then move on to, uh, you know, because obviously I looked at the terms and conditions, so I wanted to see whether uh, there are some remedies in contract law that we can use to uh, to address some of the issues that uh, these contracts uh, create, uh, but I then look beyond the contract because often uh, we have problems that cannot be found in a particular term of a specific contract that go beyond that. For example, manipulation, discrimination, etc. Uh, so I, I look at other legal regimes, particular product liability and unfair commercial practices, um, and and then I the the last two chapters are about data protection, essentially, and the, the, this tension between data protection and intellectual property, and the tension between intellectual property and uh, antitrust. And then I conclude with some, um, some sort of notes around the commons uh, and the idea of collective resistance. Now, we don't have a lot of time, and so I'm not going to uh, go into detail uh, about all of these chapters, etc. I'm going to uh, skim through through them and then focus on the last one, so that we have maybe some conversation also, because the last one is the one that uh, Professor Borghi has uh, shared with you. So obviously using Echo's categories, uh, not Echo as in Amazon Echo, but Umberto Echo, um, I don't want to be uh, apocalyptico. Mm. So I want to recognize that that the IoT can be a good thing. All these kind of a fancy gadgets that we have can be a good thing. They can give us new functionalities, new services. Uh, they can save us time if we are if we are in a driverless car and we don't have to to drive and we can do other things. That's that's obviously something positive. Um, can save us money, it can be good for the environment if we're thinking about smart uh, thermostats. Uh, it can give us personalized products and services, it can be more secure and it can be more efficient. So all very good things. Um, but I do think that at the moment the negatives uh, are prevail over uh, the positives. Um, for me there's kind of a, I think something I think about is this. Why does your kettle need to be smart? So my brother-in-law for Christmas gave me a smart kettle and he thought it was a very cool thing. Uh, and I immediately sold it on uh, Facebook Marketplace. Uh, because this idea that I would need my kettle to be connected to the internet and sending data about how many times I have a cup of tea, I thought it was absolutely absurd and dangerous. Because it normalizes the idea that we need to be we need all our products to be constantly connected and sending data to the cloud and to the manufacturer, etc. Whereas probably we don't. I think it's the main uh, practical kind of advice that I, I tend to give is just think about the trade-off. If we want, if you want something smart, you need to consider that that's going to have an impact on your fundamental rights. If you're happy with that because you're gaining something useful out of it, then it's fine. But you need to be aware of the trade-off. So what are the main issues uh, for consumers? And I'm gonna go really just skim through uh, the six of them and then focus on the last, uh, on the last one. Uh, the first one is what I call uh, contractual quagmire or ginepraio uh, contractuale. It, I think for most people, uh, in the moment when you say something like Alexa, uh, what's the weather like? 
probably you, you're not necessarily aware that you are triggering 246 contracts. And in theory, you should read all those uh, contracts or contractual documents in general legals, we, we say in, uh, in the UK. Uh, you should read the terms of use, terms of service, terms and conditions, conditions of use, conditions of sale, notices, agreements, policies, certifications, guidelines, use of rules, etc., etc., etc. Obviously, you're not uh, you're not going to do it. I did it because that you know was the point of, of my uh, of my research, and I found a number of problems with uh, with these contracts. The fact that the object of these contracts is usually quite obscure; it's actually hard to understand what the contract uh, is about. Um, it uh, defines, for example, service and, and, and these contracts define service and, and goods and products in very inconsistent ways, so you don't know exactly what, uh, what the, those rules apply to. Uh, the contractual parties are often unidentified, so you don't know who's the other party to that, uh, to that contract, and this in practical terms, who do you sue when you don't know who's the other uh, party? Uh, only nine of these 246 uh, terms and conditions uh, could be found in the legal section uh, of, uh, of Amazon. The rest, you have to find them if you're lucky, or if you spend, like me, months looking for them. Uh, talking to uh, Amazon customer uh, support, talking to other consumers, to try and map them all. And, and again, 246 is a conservative estimate. There are many more, but these are the ones that I could find. Um, and the other point, obviously, from a you know, more IP perspective, intellectual property perspective, was that uh, if you read these documents, you realize that essentially every single aspect of your smart devices is covered by some form of intellectual property or related, uh, related rights. There are issues of transparency, obviously, uh, that are connected as well uh, with fairness. Uh, for example, if you look at only the 24 main contracts, not, not the 246, there are 24 contracts that I call the core contracts, the ones that you really, really need to, to read uh, to, to know what's going to be of your rights. Uh, so these 24, 24 contracts are 457 pages uh, long, so it would take you 20 hours to read them. So essentially before saying, uh, Alexa, show me the letter, <coughs> Uh, before that, you would have to spend 20 hours to go through these 456 pages and see what happens to your uh, rights. And also, these documents are not really readable. Uh, in particular, they are as complex as um, Machiavelli's Il Principe. Um, I'm not going to go, uh, like, I'm, I'm just going to skim through, um, through these things because I think it's already quite... Uh, quite late, but essentially for each of these uh, consumer issues, I try and see if the law can provide an answer. And what I find is that maybe, the answer usually is meh, which means yes, you can interpret the law or tweak it to make it work in this uh, in these contexts, but these are just tactical approaches. Um, they're not, they don't really resolve the problems. These are things that you can do if there is litigation uh, and, and you want to try and argue your case, but these are not going to change the IoT for the better and make it socially just, which is the purpose, uh, well, at least should be, I think, our, uh, our goal in thinking about the IoT. So we looked at the contractual fork mire. The second point uh, is what we call private ordering by bricking. So private ordering uh, is this idea that, yes, we have a kind of a law that is passed by, um, by parliaments around the world, and, that's, uh, and then there is the interpretation by courts, but there is also something else that is increasingly important, private ordering. Private ordering means essentially that the private decisions of private companies um, sometimes can have the same um, influence on your behavior, or even more influence on your behavior, than traditional law, and by when it, what I mean in particular is through uh, through terms and conditions, contracts that you don't read, uh, but also through design. How the internet is designed is a way to influence your behavior, and this obviously goes back to the famous CODA's law uh, by Lessig and Techno 
regulation by, uh, by Roundsworth. Um, I'm going to look at, I've looked at a particular type of private ordering that is what we can call private ordering by a bricking. Have you, have you ever heard of this expression, um, bricking? No. Okay, so bricking is, is the transformation of, uh, uh, essentially it's the termination of a smart product. So, because in this phone there are, uh, obviously, there's software running in it and other you know, digital components and the manufacturer has control over those digital components, if the manufacturer wants, they can deactivate my phone. It's pretty uh, easy to do. So, breaking traditionally is this remote deactivation of smart products. Okay? Uh, you can see how this is a form of uh, private ordering, of regulation of your behavior. Because if you don't have any control over your device and the manufacturer can uh, remotely deactivate it, they can downgrade it, um, they can um, essentially, they can prevent you from exercising your rights. If you think about IP and, and you know, copyright exceptions and, and all those things, um, they can um, do, essentially they can prevent you from exercising control over your, uh, over your device. And I think an example that probably you are familiar with uh, is the famous uh, example of the or Orwell's uh, e-books some years ago now, uh, so it's pre, sort of pre, uh, before the IoT became a thing, although it, it couldn't be regarded as formed by IoT. Um, at some point what happened was that uh, many users, uh, many Kindle users, I don't know if you read, do you read ebooks? Do you use a Kindle? Some of you? Uh, many of them, they had purchased copies of books by Orwell, in particular 1984, and uh, the uh, animal farm, and at some point, uh, one day they, they, they were they tried to open them, and they disappeared from their uh, from their Kindle. And the alleged reason for it was that there had been some copyright infringement, and therefore the uh, the Amazon took back uh, those ebooks. Obviously, this would not be possible with a traditional traditional book, and this is a very kind of clear example of what do. Uh, we mean by bricking, because what's left of a Kindle reader if you don't have any books in it? It's absolutely uh, useless. Um, so in, and this is a form of techno regulation. In the book, I try and see if there are legal solutions to, uh, to the problem of uh, bricking. Again, I'm, I'm not gonna uh, go into them, but maybe we can discuss if there is uh, time, the right to repair uh, is obviously something I look at. Um, and the answer is currently the, the right to repair doesn't exist uh, under EU law. It's not an actual right to repair. And then I look at sale of goods uh, and, and whether uh, the breaking can be regarded as a lack of conformity. But again, I'm not, uh, not going to go into that. I think it's more important that we have an overview of what the issues uh, are. The third issue is what I call IT commerce, IoT commerce. I know that with Professor Borghi you looked at e-commerce in detail, so I don't need to talk about that. Uh, IoT commerce is this fusion between the Internet of Things and, uh, and e-commerce. So the idea that you can use all these smart devices, not just you know, go use your computer and go on like Amazon and buy something, but you can use your virtual assistants and other smart devices to, uh, to buy products. And the problem here, uh, well, there are a number of problems. One of the problems uh, is that in the IoT commerce, uh, you have a world of, that is virtually interface-free. So what does that mean? When you are working on a computer, you have a big screen, right? So you can read all the information you need, if you want to read it, uh, before making a purchase. <coughs> when you are using um, Alexa, and you're talking to Alexa, you don't have a screen where you can read the information. Like, to want, if, if you want to simplify the, uh, the issue. And that's a problem from a legal perspective, because obviously we know that we have a duty of pre-contractual information. So before concluding a contract, you need to inform uh, your consumer, and you need to inform the consumer in a legible way. What does legible means when you don't have a screen where you can read the text? Uh, so that's 
one of the uh, one of the problems, and this is going to be increasingly more of a problem. The more your house becomes smart, so you have 1,000 different smart devices in your own home, the more you're becoming unaware of the fact that you are contracting. You don't even know that you are contracting uh, anymore. And in this uh, part of the book, I look at not only law reform but also legal design. I don't know. If, uh, if it, legal design is something that you kind of considered at any point, um, but it's it's a new methodology that Rosana Lucato, Margarita, uh, Margaret Hagen, and, and others are um, sort of trialing to think about how we can apply legal methodologies to uh, to the law. If you haven't come across it, I think it's really uh, it's really important that you uh, you consider it. So that's definitely part of the solution. Think about new approaches to the. Um, application and interpretation of the law like legal design. Uh, another issue is cyber vulnerability. Okay, so here what's, uh, what's the problem? The problem is that um, we are increasingly dependent on our smart devices. So uh, my phone has become an appendix to my body. I will never go anywhere without my phone, it's always going to be here with me um, and essentially most of the things I do I wouldn't be able to do them without my uh, smart devices so the vulnerability, if my smart devices are vulnerable I am vulnerable because they are part, an extension of my body in that sense we can talk about cyborg vulnerability um, I look at whether we can use product liability uh, to address this issue. It's a uh, strict liability regime that we have in the EU and, and member states uh, uh, to compensate damages <coughs> caused by defective products. Um, this in theory is a very good uh, answer to the problem. Um, however, it's, uh, it's a law from 1987 if I remember correctly and I, I'm not going to say it's never been used but it's never been uh, particularly popular. It's, in practice, it, it's, not, uh, it's not been particularly relevant. Two weeks ago, the European Commission has presented a proposal to replace this directive, so we'll see what happens, uh, what happens there. Um, again, I'm not... Um, I, I think the reform is a good one. If you want to discuss that, we can discuss it during the, uh, the Q&A, but it still has some problems, in particular problems related to the tension between access to the data and intellectual property. There is, uh, there is I think, a problem to, to discuss there. Um, another issue in the IoT is the, what I call the Internet of Personalized Things. So if you look at this, our mission to be Earth's most customer-centric company. That is a uh, slogan by uh, Amazon. What do you think? It's a good thing, right? To be customer-centric. You want that. You want to be at the center, right? Yeah. Hmm? Yes. But what's the other side of it? If you are at the center of everything, how how can you be at the center of everything? Only if Amazon knows everything about you, okay? And do you want Amazon to know everything about you? Um, and to personalize the service, personalize. What about personalizing the cost? So a cost that is just for you, because Amazon knows that you're willing to pay more for certain things and less for others. What about personalizing in the sense that, um, that you live in a poor part of, of Turin and therefore you're not going to be uh, exposed to some, certain job adverts for high paying jobs, or if you're black and you're excluded for certain, uh, from certain services. So, Personalization has another phase that is manipulation uh, and in some instances also discrimination. So again, going back to the idea of these trade-offs, yes, this is something that is very cool, but there is a dark, uh, dark side to it. And I suppose this is also this idea of altering our needs, uh, altering our beliefs, uh, altering our identity is something that is not new. Uh, it's, it's the whole point, as Rosa Luxemburg put it, of capitalism. Capitalism is all about creating new needs that you didn't know you had in you. 
and the IoT is exactly the same uh, thing in that um, in that way. How does it do it through uh, through all the data that it has about you, through tracking you across devices, uh, through uh, targeting you when you are home um, in the you know smart home, targeting you in the city in the smart city, targeting you in your own body uh, when you have implanted devices. Uh, etc. And knowing all your bias, biases and your vulnerabilities, they can find the best ways to uh, target you. Um, and uh, this is, I think, a good quote by, um, from the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts, when Marx said, uh, under private property, every person speculates on creating a new need in another, so as to drive him to a fresh sacrifice, to place him in a new dependence and to seduce him into a new mode of gratification. The less you are, the less you express your life, the more you have, the greater is your alienated life and the greater is the saving of your alienated uh, being. So again, you can see this convergence between uh, capitalism and the, uh, and the IoT. Uh, I tried, um, and again I'm not going to go into it unless you ask me during the Q&A, uh, I tried to see if uh, we can address this problem of the internet of personalized things through uh, fair commercial practices um, and probably the answer is no uh, because the unfair commercial practices are focused just on the economic interests of the consumer and manipulation and discrimination tend to go beyond uh, the economic uh, the economic interests um, other issue is what I call the internet of blues do you know what a loo is? it's a posh way to say toilet okay. so internet of toilets we could say um, Let's see what, what do I mean um, by that. So the, the starting point is that the IoT normalizes the idea of ubiquitous tracking. The idea that we are constantly tracked wherever we go, every activity of our life, from running to going to the toilet, we'll see in a second, uh, becomes something that can be tracked, monetized and exploited. Um, and there is, we are told essentially that we have to choose. Either we have functionalities of the IoT or we have our privacy. We, we cannot have both. Um, why? Because, as Amazon put it, Alexa is in the cloud and always gets smarter. So if you want Alexa to always get smarter, you need to give up your data. That's the only thing that you can do. Otherwise, it's not going to get any smarter, right? And what's the point of having a dumb Alexa? I mean, it's already quite dumb. Um, the other point is that we think often that the, this data about us running or uh, again uh, with smart toilets going, um, going to the loo uh, is trivial data. That doesn't really matter. I mean, what are they going to do with it? It doesn't have any intrinsic value. The problem is that what we call, or Burkashev and other call, um, cumulative disclosures. It means that data that you think in a certain point in time is trivial, doesn't really matter, over time becomes actually really valuable and create a profile of you that can be used against, uh, against you. Uh, in other words, the, the IoT challenges the idea of what's private. You know, we said it overcomes the binary good services offline, online, uh, but also private and public. Why? Uh, some of the things I studied are these devices called Echo Spot and Echo Look. Uh, they are uh, an alarm, a sveya, and um, a style, personal stylist, um, an assistente personale that tells you um, how to, if you look good with this jacket, these kind of things. Um, and they are designed, they have cameras and other sensors in it, and they are designed to be in your bedroom and in your bathroom while you get ready. So, what happens in a world where we consider normal to have a camera that is recording us in our bathroom? or sensors next to us in our bedroom. Are those spaces still private? Do we still have a reasonable expectation of privacy in those spaces? If we are accepting, if we are buying those devices? That's the real question. And then, obviously, the problem uh, that we became really clear when Amazon bought uh, the smart doorbell uh, known as Ring is that, um, essentially, Amazon is creating the largest uh, surveillance network in the world private public surveillance network in the world. Why? 
because then they are sharing that data with law enforcement agencies. Data about when you're home, when you're not home, etc. And now, you probably you, you've seen it, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, that Amazon has acquired uh, iRobot, that is the producer of Roomba. So that's, you know, very useful data uh, about, uh, about us. What I looked um, at in, in this part of the book was uh, this tension between trade secrets, the use of trade secrets to um, kind of uh, monopolize, that's the wrong word, but to retain control over our data, the tension between these trade secrets and our rights of access under the GDPR. Um, and my conclusion was that, uh, that the right of access to some extent can prevail, um, but, but in reality uh, this, this doesn't provide a meaningful defense to our, uh, to our rights. So what I'm going to spend maybe a couple of words on in terms of actual, actual law and not only the problems um, is the death of ownership. Okay? Um, I was really influenced by this book um, owned by Josh, uh, Josh Fairfield uh, where he puts forward the idea that um, yes we buy our smart devices etc but we don't actually um, own them. We are um, digital tenants, we are serfs, uh, and the IoT company is the digital landlord. Okay? The, this, it's a sort of parallel with medieval times. It, from a historical point of view, it's probably not particularly accurate, but I think it sells the idea, it's a good metaphor to think about things. So what do we mean by death of ownership? We can mean two different things. Uh, one is uh, formal death of ownership. It means that you're not buying a product, you are leasing it. Okay? So increasingly, for example, when you can lease um, a car, a smart connected car, and then you're going to give it back uh, after two years, and the manufacturer is going to dispose of, uh, of the car and you're going to lease a new one. Okay? And this is really good in terms of circular economy, right? Uh, but it does come with problems. Because if you own something, you have certain rights under the law. If you don't own something, you don't have those uh, rights. But that's not what I look at. Uh, what I look at, um, and again this is the chapter that Professor Borghi shared with you, um, is uh, essentially substantial uh, or um, effective debt of ownership. What do I mean by that? Is that we, in theory, we buy our smart devices. However, we cannot exercise the rights of the owner. Why? Because the IoT company retains factual, legal uh, and technological control over the device. And that's what I'm going to, um, I'm going to look at. So we have, so IoT companies retain control over the device through intellectual property contracts, uh, but also factual and technical control. In terms of intellectual property, um, I'm going to use this very useful kind of a uh, diagram by the EUIPO um, that shows you that um, every aspect of your, uh, of your phone is protected through some form of intellectual property rights. The obvious examples are kind of the, the copyright on the uh, operating system, um, but, but obviously there are many more because increasingly patents are used to uh, protect effectively uh, software, although in theory you shouldn't be able to patent uh, software, as well as trade secrets on the, on the algorithms, uh, trademarks, design rights, utility models, etc. So essentially all the intellectual property rights you encounter in your life are present in this very simple, in theory simple product and they tend to belong to different companies, to different subjects. So this creates a lot of tensions and this means that uh, certain things that you could do in theory, you should be entitled to do, for example, under copyright exceptions and limitations, you're not going to be able to do them because that they would constitute a form of patent infringement. For example, uh, they exercise contractual control, IoT companies exercise contractual control over the thing, uh, we mentioned already this idea of the contractual court mire, this 254 contract. Mm. 
Uh, just to make an example of what uh, do I mean by contractual control, there is this term from the Amazon Prime video terms of use for I, where it says, in a quote, purchased digital content may become unavailable and Amazon will not be liable to you. Okay? So what does purchased mean? Hmm? Yeah, you paid for it and you bought it. It's a compravendit in theory. You're buying something, purchased. Uh, you're not renting something, you're not leasing something, you're purchasing something. But at the same time, Amazon can at some point make that uh, video, because we're talking about videos, films, etc., unavailable to you, and nobody will be liable for it. So what kind of uh, ownership do you have on something when uh, that something can disappear, can become unavailable, and nobody will be liable for it? I'm sorry, I don't know why, it sounds like I'm shouting. Um, but this is just an example of how uh, contractual control is exercised over the thing. Factual control. So IoT companies exercise factual control over the data uh, generated by our uh, smart devices and the service provided through the smart devices. One of the things I did um, in, in writing the book was to submit a subject access request to Amazon. Do you know what's a subject access request? No? You know that under the GDPR you can ask any... Yeah, you can ask to access your personal data under the uh, Regolamento sulla Generale sulla Protezione dei Dati Personali. Um, so, in theory, I have a right to, to have a copy of the data that Amazon has about me. So, I wanted to exercise that right. Uh, I asked the, uh, Amazon for my data. Um, after some time, I managed to, to have a response. There was essentially hundreds of spreadsheets like a lot of different attachments in an Excel format um, that looked a little bit like the table that you see on this slide. Um, which, what does this table tell you? Really nothing. There is no meaningful information. There is nothing, nothing juicy that I want to, you know, that I'm really interested in. I really want to know what does Amazon know about me. These tables don't tell me that. Really, they don't. Uh, they, tell, they do tell me something, um, like the fact that they know that I live in two countries. For example, that I travel between uh, the UK and, and Italy, because it's GB and IT. That's already something. But I don't know much about the inferences that these companies uh, make based on the data that they have about me. I don't know anything about the profiles that they have uh, about me. So in this sense, they retain factual control over um, over the data and over the service. Technical control is the example of smart uh, tractors well, where increasingly um, with smart devices they build some sort of digital locks that prevent you from actually, for example, repairing your uh, device. And this leads to a number of issues in terms of decreased uh, consumer power of the device, increased corporate power of the device, increased corporate power over the user-generated uh, content. Okay, so this is a form of this. Well, I think this is a form of tragedy uh, of the uh, of the anti-commons, and I wanted to see if we could tackle the debt of ownership uh, using the law, in particular using uh, intellectual property law. And I looked at uh, libero utilizzazione, so uh, exceptions and limitations, uh, the principle of exhaustion, a number of. Uh, mechanisms in intellectual property that can be used in theory um, to empower uh, the user. However, in practice, uh, they were not of any meaningful help uh, because of a problem that we call IP overlaps. So what I was saying before is that you have, for example, certain rights under copyright law, uh, but you cannot exercise them because the exercise of that right in, under copyright law uh, equates to form of patent infringement, of an infringement of another intellectual property right. So I looked outside of intellectual uh, property law, I looked at competition law, and in particular all the case law around uh, standard essential patents and abuse of dominant position, and I don't know if it's something you've engaged with at some point, but essentially it fails. It doesn't look like um, 
at least in this in this field, competition law is doing much to help us uh, uh, help us consumers of uh, IoT devices. I looked at ethics. Uh, I don't know if you're aware that there is an ethical turn at the moment, uh, where instead of uh, regulating technologies through the law, uh, companies uh, increasingly use ethical manifestos, ethical charters, uh, to say we abide by these ethical values so you can trust us. <laughs> Obviously you can imagine that there are a number of problems with these non-binding uh, instruments. Um, so what I want to focus on the remaining time, which probably is going to be a couple of minutes at this point, um, is this uh, idea of the of the commons. Uh, is, do you, have you ever come across uh, the concept of commons? Yes, some of you. Uh, so you know, this, the idea that things like uh, water should be, uh, you know, uh, commons or, um, I don't know if you remember all the occupations of uh, theatres, public theatres that had been abandoned and then they were occupied by the local uh, the local people. These are the kind of traditional ideas of the commons, and as uh, Hesse and Ostrom argued, and others, uh, also knowledge, information is or should be um, a commons as well. Uh, the commons can be, in the context of new technologies, can mean maybe two things. One is the thing that you're more familiar with is the concept of open access. Um, do you know what open access is? Yes, um, we'll see it very briefly in a second, but what I'm really interested in is the other meaning of uh, the commons. The commons as a form of radical collective resistance to power. Um, the idea of commons as open source, um, you might have heard of the, the idea of the free and open uh, source software, probably and the creative commons, all things that Nexa has obviously contributed to um, massively, um, so the idea that you should be able to, to really um, contribute and see the codes of, uh, of the software. At the same time, as a sort of uh, what we've seen in recent years has been the depolitization of, uh, of open source software. Essentially with big tech uh, appropriating and, and hijacking the open source, uh, the open source movement. Uh, what we need is also open standards, right? And, I, and again, it's something Nexa has been working on. Uh, however, you have the problem that uh, standards are increasingly shaped by consortia that are controlled by uh, big tech. We need open data, uh, but we've seen that uh, data is increasingly controlled through trade <coughs> secrets and uh, through generous rights and other uh, technical and technical means. We need open hardware, um, but usually when you try and, and, and argue for open hardware, they will tell you that's not secure enough, uh, which is, uh, I don't think it's necessarily true. Uh, we need open platforms, and that's probably something you have studied um, if you've looked at the Digital Markets Act, uh, Digital Services Act, all these kind of new acts in the EU that try to um, force um, in theory, force uh, platforms to be more open and transparent. However, the end result risks being the opposite because you are essentially forcing these platforms to become uh, the internet police to be actually to monitor uh, users. So that's that's a dangerous uh, it's a dangerous um, sort of development. But what I'm more interested in is the idea of um, commons as a form of collective resistance to, uh, to power. Now, uh, usually uh, in IP we use lock to explain why IP exists, uh, and the idea is that uh, you, uh, the justification for property and intellectual property is, is labor. So by, through our work, we work the land, uh, you know, we, uh, and therefore we have a right to own the fruits of that land and that should apply also to uh, intellectual property, uh, IP, uh, etc. Marx, um, in a way, unveils the fiction uh, uh, of, of uh, Locke. In particular, he says that in the factory, the labor is organized collectively. 
So if there are rights that flow from labor, these rights must be collective. So labor can only justify, according to Marx, collective rights. So that's, that's what I'm more interested in. Uh, not so much in our kind of individual rights, but our collective, um, collective dimension. And if, if that's true, how does that play out in the context of the IoT? And the IoT, and we can use you know, the important work that other um, fellows of Nexa have done around the ideas of digital uh, labor. In the IoT, we are workers. So when you are liking a picture on uh, Instagram, you are working, okay? You are teaching Instagram, you know, what you like, you're teaching Instagram, you know, this is a person, this is what I look like, etc., etc. So you are working. So uh, you, we users of the IoT, we are workers. And if we are workers, then we should have collective rights over the IoT. Uh, the commons can be regarded as the realm of uh, radical democracy. Um, we've seen, for example, one of the most famous examples was the occupation of Jesse Park uh, in Turkey uh, when uh, the Turkish government wanted to transform this big park in the middle of the city into a shopping center and the local population occupied it to make sure that that wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't happen. Um, but what about these occupation movements, these uh, collective resistance movements? Why don't they happen also with regard to the intangible world, the internet? Why don't we fight for a better internet in the same way that we fight for public water, for example? Um, in reality, we've seen some examples of, uh, of resistance. Um, I remember you referred to this in your, uh, in your paper. Uh, this Morris of Emria uh, research around uh, smart city and uh, resistance. Uh, this paper looks at citizen-led movements to create forms of data commons in Barcelona, for example. Uh, and I think that's what really interesting. And that's, that links, links back to the Ukrainian uh, example that I started with. Remember when you know, the American farmers came together with uh, Ukrainian uh, hackers to essentially fix the smart uh, tractors. I think that's where I see more the solution to the problems that we've seen uh, in this presentation, the problems uh, in, in the IoT. Um, in a way, because the IoT challenges the, these dichotomies between physical and digital, I think that the IoT represents an unprecedented opportunity to extend the conflict from you know, traditional material resources to the internet, including, uh, including the internet of things. And we've started seeing already some action. We've seen some organized action. Um, so for example, there is uh, the important ruling uh, against the Liberu, um, where essentially the trade union, uh, which I think was QGL, uh, essentially acted on behalf of the, uh, of the drivers of the riders of Deliveroo against the algorithm that Deliveroo was, uh, was using. But we've seen also what we call tech clash. So employees of Google uh, and other big tech essentially protesting against their employers because their employers wanted to sell their technologies to be used in unethical ways, in warfare for example, to discriminate. Uh, etc. In the IoT in particular, we've seen a lot of bottom-up movements uh, like the Open IoT uh, certification mark in, in, in London, uh, obviously Arduino, even though it has all the, its problems, uh, Trustable Tech, um, Aribada, a lot of different bottom-up collective projects where you can see forms of resistance to IoT uh, power. And my hope is in particular in the 1987, nearly 2000, uh, for example, meetups that we had around the world that are focused on the IoT and where with 1,500,000 members that are mostly based in the Global South. So there is something coming from, from particular from the Global South uh, as, a, as a way of resistance to um, IoT power abuses. Um, I'm going to conclude because I think we are beyond uh, you know, the time. Um, 
you can see on this uh, on this slide, you know, I mentioned the right to repair. The right to repair is broken. Uh, it doesn't exist in the EU. But precisely because the law doesn't work, that's when citizens can come together to try and fix the problems that we have. So we have a massive, massive right to repair movement in Europe uh, and in the US, including, you can see here, Giacimento Urbani, we have here two Italian uh, realities. Uh, we have a lot of uh, things happening, including in Turin. Uh, and next up, there are a number of projects, uh, including this project on socially sustainable artificial intelligence in urban context. I don't know if uh, they are here today, but they have uh, very cool ideas around this idea of a digital twin uh, for, the, for the city of Turin, and in particular with a focus on inequalities. How we can use technologies and, and co collaborative efforts to overcome uh, inequalities, but also this uh, hub called the Global Shapers Community uh, of Turin, where a lot of very young uh, people, very, a very diverse uh, community are putting forward and coming together a number of projects uh, to change things. In, uh, as you can see in the, on this slide, one of the projects is called Scale 360, and it's about realizing circular innovation through bottom-up uh, approaches. So, this is the... Um, my conclusion, or as I call it here, INITSI, because I hope that this is actually a start, not only of a conversation, but of, uh, of a fight. Um, I, I think that the IoT is a real threat to our fundamental rights and to our vision of what society uh, we want to go uh, towards. Uh, from a tactical point of view, there are many things that can be done as lawyers in terms of interpreting or tweaking uh, the law and reform it to make it better, more fit for the IoT, new approaches like legal design. But from a strategic point of view, that's not going to resolve the problem. That's not going to make the IoT socially uh, just. Um, the commons, I think, are going to do that. Uh, not only through open source, if we conceive it uh, in a genuine sense, if we open everything, if we open not only uh, software, but also hardware, data, standards, platforms, etc. Uh, but also, more importantly, commons as a collective uh, form of resistance. Uh, I do think that this idea of rematerialization uh, is really a great opportunity to, again, extend the conflict from the uh, from the material, traditional material world to the cyber-physical world. And that's all for me.